Scott, a member of the CWI management team, uh, has the honors to give the award to Martin on behalf of Ton uh, de Kock, our director, as well as the management team at large, who decided who will get this prize. So Martin, uh, here it is. <laughs> Uh, super happy to be back at CWI. I mean, I have a lot of fond memories from this place and a lot of friends. I wanted to start by, by thanking for this amazing honor. I wanted to thank, the, of course, the CWI, the fellowship committee. I wanted to thank the organizers, Stefan and others. I wanted to thank all of you. I was actually, I didn't realize that CWI sent an invitation to a lot of universities, and I see a lot of very familiar faces from, ab from abroad even. So thank you so much for coming. I um, wanted to thank the speakers, amazing talks, lots of good old friends giving this talk, so it's very, made, made this day very, very special. So thank you again. And of course, thank you, Peter, for uh, this nice introduction of me. Um, so when I was told I'm getting this recognition, I decided to familiarize myself a bit more with the person behind it, so Mr. Dijkstra. And it so happens that two years ago, uh, a book has been published about him, um, edited by Tony Hoare and another CWI legend, Krzysztof Abt. I'm not sure if he's here, but he's there. Awesome. And uh, it's a great book. It's a, combination, a collection of papers by Dijkstra, but also uh, some commentaries from some amazing people like Leslie Lamport talks about uh, his work on uh, concurrency. Uh, and there are some, of course, some in interesting stories. What I found amazing is that I knew that Dijkstra existed. And I knew of some of his work. You know, of course, like shortest path algorithm and uh, semaphores and stuff like this. But I didn't know how broad his contributions were. And uh, also, while he's at least for me, he was best known for his specific technical contributions. I didn't realize how much he focused on programming as, as art, as process, as uh, principles of that. And I think that's nicely summarized in his 1972 uh, commendation for his Turing Award, which is not about semaphores. It's not about the shortest path algorithm. It's about that, where he was recognized for treating programming as this higher, abstract, wonderful thing uh, that needs to be done properly. And I think we can all learn from that. So just being mentioned in a single sentence with him is a great honor, because he was a giant. So a bit about me. I mean, Peter already told, said a lot about me. But I wanted to say maybe that my path is slightly unorthodox, So because um, I really, except for internships, I never worked anywhere, except for the companies I kind of co-created. And uh, right now, I left Snowflake, uh, and I'm focusing. My, my kind of biggest actual thing I'm doing is I'm trying to help support Polish uh, startup ecosystem. I'm from Poland. And through advising, investing, and so on. Also, I'm engaged with a bunch of nonprofits that work on that and other things. Um, so when I was asked to give some talk today, you know, I didn't want to talk about some technical thing, but I decided to talk about the, maybe the biggest lesson I have learned, especially when I compare my time at Vectorwise and my time at Snowflake. And I couldn't find a better name. I called, I called it the importance of product, but I hope you'll get what I mean. So again, some background. Because I have to say I, uh, a few, few things about this place. You know, I came here in 2001, joined the INS1 group. Uh, in Dutch, it's called Insane. Very telling. <laughs> uh, <laughs> it was started by uh, Martin Kirsten, who is unfortunately no longer with us. And um, what he did, he created a group not only building nor publishing and doing great research, but also a, a group that actually 
was focused on building a system. And he distilled it in, in people that followed him that you know, building systems is just as important as doing research. And you can see in the group that that thing perseveres and, and, and stays. I think it's amazing. And of course, Martin had a few senior researchers working with him, Arjen de Vries, Niels Nes, and Stefan Manegold. I think they're all here. But when I came to visit CWI, I first spoke with Martin and Niels. We had a very inspired talk. I knew this is the place for me. But they put me with this guy. <laughs> <laughs> and they made him, he didn't even have a PhD yet. And they made him a master to this supervisor. Um, so he also later became a PhD supervisor. Um, but I mentioned him because Peter, over the years, become, became more than that. Uh, he's, uh, he was my mentor, my, my friend, and, and partner with uh, a bunch of things. And for all the PhD students here, I, I want to say I, I wish you have a similar relationship with your supervisor as I had with Peter, or have with Peter, because he's very special. And, and I wouldn't be where I am and who I am without Peter. So thank you, Peter. I, I think like Thomas and Victor maybe have something similar. I don't know. It's, I think it's, 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 it's amazing. Um, OK, so we already talked about, actually, you can tell we didn't coordinate slides. You'll see some more. So I'm not going to tell more about it. Uh, one anecdote, when I came to CWI, I wanted to do a thesis on very, very theoretical databases, which would make you know, some people from the theory uh, part of CWI maybe happy. But they convinced me to do something more practical. The thing is, what Peter mentioned, that I came up with some idea, it's true, but I didn't understand what I came up with. So I just put it in the thesis. I went back to Poland. But I didn't understand that it would become this big thing, vectorized square processing. Uh, it was Peter who something must have clicked in his wonderful brain. And uh, he, based on that, wrote this prototype. He showed that it works. He talked about it. He invited me back for PhD. We did these things. I'll, I'll go quickly because he talked about all of that. Um, now, in 2008, we're kind of getting to more interesting parts. I was about to finish, and uh, we knew we have something amazing, or we thought we had something amazing. Um, we believed that this is something that has to be shared with the world. And you know, we had the results. We were able to prove that this thing works and it's fast and it's amazing. Um, so we were like, okay, it's gonna sell itself. We don't need to do anything. We'll, you know, every, everybody will want it. So, so we went and we looked for uh, partners to, in industry to make, bring this technology to the world. So we even went to California. We spoke with a bunch of companies, big companies, startups, and pretty much nobody was interested. And we were kind of disappointed, shocked, maybe to some extent. And with a hindsight, it's kind of clear because I think a lot of people in industry has, have, have seen researchers coming up with wonderful things that only works, work in the labs, right? It's very hard for people from industry to really embrace an idea from academics. It needs to be very strongly validated before it gets, gets out there. Luckily, we had some luck. I mean, we, we managed to form this uh, partnership with Ingress. We formed uh, Vectorwise. And you know, over the years, again, as Peter said, we worked on integrating this technology into their product. On the way, we were doing a lot of cool research with some amazing master students, many of whom are here, and work for Databricks. Well, nobody. Uh, it's OK. It's OK. Uh, uh, we're still friends. Um, and this is a photo from the, I think, 2010, Dumb to Dumb. So we also had some fun. Um, and in 2011, we published our first official results. And bear in mind, these were not results of some academic benchmarks. These are the official industrial benchmark results validated by a third party with you know, very strict rules and everything. And we showed that this product, not technology, but this product can deliver you know, more than double the performance of any other system in the history. And if you, it's maybe hard to read, but also at a fraction of the price. And, and I think that's, that's what made people you know, uh, understand this thing really works. 
And I think this was needed, this was necessary for this technology that we had to achieve the success and adoption that it has today. Because Peter, again, we didn't coordinate, same slide. Um, I think we would, it, would, it would get there, but without the work in vector-wise, I think it might, might have taken uh, you know, a much, much longer time. Sometimes I wish we, should, I mean, I mean, we, we joke we should have patented it, but with all honesty, I'm glad we didn't because the world is a better place. <laughs> but, and here's a lesson. Um, it was not a success, so technology was successful, it was adopted everywhere, but the company wasn't, and maybe why? We, we did a lot of really amazing things there, a lot of cool stuff. Um, but maybe because of our backgrounds, we were extremely focused on performance because also we thought this is the most distinguishing feature of, the, of it and um, the coolest part. Um, but the product we built was, was good, but it wasn't really great because we didn't appreciate how much work needs to be put into the other parts of the product. So things like usability, stability, features. Um, our you know, sales were also maybe not so good. But the end result was that the technology was successful, but the product and the company were, well, were not the success perhaps it could have been. Um, it was a hard lesson, but a lesson nevertheless. So the second part of my story was, was Snowflake. And you know, we talked about the clouds, so I'm gonna skip that. But what's important here is that these two French guys, Benoit and Thierry, they decided to go against the stream be the salmon, as they say, and everybody was working on Hadoop. They, want, they thought building a database for the cloud is the way to go, and they asked me to join. And the difference at Snowflake is that Snowflake, I mean, invented and built a lot of really cool technology. Because we, you know, we had state-of-the-art performance comp comparable with VectorWise, maybe a bit slower because we didn't spend that much time polishing it. But because we were building for a new platform, we had to come, come up with a lot of solutions, completely novel solutions for, 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 for the cloud. So in terms of technical innovation, you know, Snowflake is up there, for sure. However, I don't think that's the main reason Snowflake is so successful. The main reason is Snowflake focused a lot on building a wonderful, great product. So things, of course it has some unique features and the fact that it could expose the elasticity that the cloud provides the world as a database system was great. But if only with that, it wouldn't be what it is today. The amount of effort that went into it, making it a great product, making it easy to use, having you know, great uh, enterprise feature, wonderful UI, functionality. And often that involved doing really boring stuff. I mean, who wants to build a, a billing system, right? It's, or, or, or security, I mean, maybe security could be interesting. Right, Martin? Security can be interesting. Uh, and I have to say, this is the biggest lesson I learned at Snowflake, and I learned it from Benoit and Thierry, because they, you know, I was coming from academia when I started VectorWise with Peter and others, but they had 10 plus years experience at Oracle. They have the battle scars. They, they worked with customers. They understood what is needed by customers. And our first main company value is put customers, customer first. And that really impacted the, the design of the product. So again, lots of technology, lots of great technology but also that relentless focus on the great product was just as important for Snowflake's success. And okay, Snowflake is super successful. I'll skip that. But the lesson is, <laughs> uh, and with a hindsight, you might call this slide naive and obvious and everything. But these are the things I didn't know, okay? So we believe that we have great technology and the rest is easy, that the product will be, you know, pretty much translation of this technology and, and uh, we're done. Um, but the lesson from VectorWise for me was that perhaps to prove that the technology works, it actually needs to be converted into a product. And 
you know, and exp exp exposed to the world, uh, not as you know, academic paper, but something that actually works um, and can be used. But the second lesson, maybe that's a lesson also from Vectorize and from Snowflake, is that having a great technology and building a product for it is not enough. Because to be successful, you also need to build a great product. And of course, it sounds easy and obvious, but I speak with a lot of founders, especially founders of uh, you know, startups, and <coughs> especially super smart, super young people fri fresh out of college. <coughs> Excuse me. They think the same way I was thinking when we were starting Vectorwise. They still think they have an idea, they have uh, invention, they have technology. They think they're done. Um, and I sometimes have to tell them that they're wrong, that there is way more work that still needs to be done. Um, luckily, there are some people that get it, and we have a wonderful product from CWI. I, you know, I really am super impressed and proud of what this team, where is Hannes and Mark? I, yeah. <laughs> they do like each other, really. It's, uh, um, I think this is an example of how technology, because with the technology, the DuckDB technology, they could have built five different products, but they found a particular niche which was amazing, just what the market needed, and then they, they probably spent, I mean, Hannes talked about you know, cool stuff they are doing, but they also uh, spent, from what I know, an insane amount of focus on making sure that the system is stable, correct, and all of these things that actually we as academics maybe don't care as much, but they got it right and they built a great product. So, kind of to sum up, uh, if you have an invention on technology, you know, I'm not an expert, but I've seen some things, so what can you do? And of course, one thing is to open source. A very popular way, but I've, I think I've seen too many academic projects just put out there on GitHub and people think, okay, it's on GitHub. It's released, right? That's not it. That's not, uh, I mean, Hannes probably can tell you that actually building a community, uh, getting, creating adoption is way more work than you think. So the other option, what we did with Vectorwise is creating a company. And I wanna share, say that I think it could be a, the best time ever to build a, an academic spin out because a lot of VCs are very into that, very interested. There are entire VC companies that only do that. Um, and there are even resources like um, manuals published by these VC companies, how to, how to spin out a company from academia. You can also do licensing. I don't really know much about it. I haven't tried that. But one thing that does worry me a bit is that pretty much Everything I've seen related to the transfer of technology from academia, I've seen in US and in UK. Probably also China, but I don't know much about that. But the EU seems to be kind of behind, and I think that's something we here need to, need to work on. So that was my short talk, not so short. I know everybody's waiting for drinks. Um, so I wanted to thank everybody again, and um, yeah, that's it. If you have any questions, I'm happy to answer. <laughs>